holding out that last few notes just a little bit longer here. <clears throat> All right. Well, it's been a busy week, but it's the Sabbath, and that is a day of rest and a day of rejuvenation. And so I trust that you will be blessed as you worship with us. Those of you who are online, we want to welcome you also to our worship service here. We have a couple of announcements and things that we need to cover for you today. First of all, <clears throat> the Oregon Conference constituency meeting is going to be taking place this summer. And we have a second reading today for the delegates who will be representing us at that meeting. They are <clears throat> Richard Clark, Mary Gaslin, and Judy Taylor. Last week we had the first reading on that nomination, and today we would like to entertain a second reading and a motion to accept these people as our de uh, delegates for that meeting. So do I have a second to that effect? Thank you, I have a second. All in favor of these three people representing us, just raise your hand. Very good. Opposed by the same sign? I don't see any opposed, so I think you three are on charging forward. So that's good. We appreciate that. The other thing we want to keep you aware of is that <clears throat> the uh, prayer meeting is looking at a series on historical books. The pastor's working through some of the Old Testament uh, books, and I believe this coming week will be on 2 Samuel. So those of you who are participating in that, that will be coming up. And if you haven't been, you're invited to come and join and become a part of that. <clears throat> there is also a flyer I don't believe this has been passed out. However, if you are interested in this um, announcement, pick one up as you leave. There are not a lot of them, but the Oregon Conference is sponsoring a conference on prayer. This is going to be at the coast and will be on March 25 through 27. It will be at the Twin Rocks Conference Center. It is at a lodge. If you are interested in attending this conference, I'm told that the rooms are going quickly. So if you are interested and you want to stay there over the weekend, please move quickly on that uh, application rather than later. So that is a prayer conference coming up in March. All right. <clears throat> Last but not least, I just want to bring to your attention that we will be having a, um, a baptism this morning. Rich Chalmers will be baptized as part of our worship service today. And uh, that is a blessing for all of us who have been baptized and is a blessing and a pleasure and a privilege to have him join us as a member of this congregation. <clears throat> In anticipation of our worship service today, I want you to consider this call to worship. This is taken from Psalms 13, verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in thy steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. It is our prayer that indeed God has met, has dealt bountifully with all of us and will continue to deal bountifully with us as we worship him. So at this time, we will move into our worship service, uh, being led by Dr. Hubble in singing. Hello, happy Sabbath. We got a jaunty song to welcome everybody and keep waking everybody up. So we're going to go to 612 Onward Christian Soldiers. 
And I'm hoping we have words, yes. Okay. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus. Go that I hadn't heard before, but that's good. Um, next, we're going to do 545, Savior Like a Shepherd.
if y'all would join us in standing to stand up, stand up for Jesus, hymn 618. seated. Good morning, church. I am so excited today to uh, baptize this individual. His name is Richard Chalmers. And uh, they came to a series of meetings not long ago by uh, Rob Zama, and as well have been attending the church at different times. His wife and son was baptized years ago through a series of meetings, I believe, Correct. that took place in Bend, Oregon. And uh, after these years, Richard has made a decision to want to follow the Lord, follow this wonderful biblical truth 
Sabbath truth, second coming of Jesus truth that we all come to know and love and believe from scripture. And uh, so we're so thankful as well that after an illness that his wife has gone through and uh, um, has been in hospital just recently, just got out a couple of days ago. She's here in this room in the back just for the purpose of being able to witness this baptism today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, Luann. All heaven rejoices on this special day when we are baptizing someone who's wanting to follow the Lord all the way. And so, Richard, because of your love for Jesus and your desire to follow him all the way, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Subject to this baptism today, is there a motion to accept Richard into our Albany Church family? And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> As Tom is closing things up, I just want to remind you that one of the responsibilities that you and I as members of this church have is we need to put some oil up there. <laughs> but we'll get there. <clears throat> In the meantime, while we wait for that, we need to take up an offering because that's what allows us to demonstrate to God our appreciation, our thankfulness for the many things that he does for us. And we in turn have the opportunity to return to him our tithes and offerings. <clears throat> There's many things that take place in this church that most of us don't even know about. There are people in this church who are doing things in this church that we don't even know about. And we wanna thank those individuals but one of the things that makes their work easier is when they have the tools and the resources that they need in order to do that work. And that's where our tithes and offerings come in. <clears throat> the other thing is, <clears throat> is that our, off, our, excuse me, our tithe is used around the world in many different ways. And so the offering that you give, the tithe that you give today, may touch the life of somebody that you have never met or never will meet until heaven. And that is a, something to think, to be thankful for. So let us just bow our heads as we have a prayer for our offering this morning. Gracious Father, you've blessed us in so many ways. And we thank you that we now can return our tithes and offerings to you. And we ask that you would bless each giver and the, bless, and the gift that they give. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our deacons will wait upon us at this time. <clears throat> As our <clears throat> offering is being taken up, I'm going to ask Mrs. McNulty to come up. We have a very few children here today, so some of us may want to join the children to make the children feel welcomed up here. But we will have our children's story at this time. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I have the children come forward? Good morning. 
I saw a few other ones in Sabbath school, but they must have left. Well, I'm glad you're here today. Well, my story today, I just, oh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Mrs. McNulty wasn't able to be here today, so I'm filling in for her. Um, our story today uh, is about the ocean. How many of you have been to the ocean? Yes, because we live so close to the Pacific Ocean, don't we? But this ocean is the Atlantic Ocean that I'm going to tell you a story about. Our family is all, all on the other side of the United States. And last summer, our family got to go to the Atlantic Ocean. And um, we uh, were able to stay with my um, daughter's in-laws. They have a place out there. And we arrived later in the day. And uh, right away, I had to go out to the ocean. And it's really warm water there. And um, there were some, some shells, quite a few, you know, broken shells. But just before we had gotten there, they had had a storm. And they told me, wait till the morning, because if you come out here early, you won't believe what you will find on the sand. Well, I got up early, went to the um, ocean, and the, sand, the beach was covered with shells. I mean, not just one kind of shell, but so many. I brought a little sample of a few of them that I picked up. Oh, let me just see if I can do this. You see the different kinds of shells? Well, you know, they're not just all the same, are they? And they were all on the same beach. And I couldn't believe what I had found there. Um, but one thing exciting was there was people walking on the beach, picking up the shells. We were all picking them up. And then I kept thinking, but you know what's really neat is that God created that. I mean, when you're walking on the beach, all those little grains of sand, God created that. And so to my amazement, you know, you pick one of these up, and I know you all have done that, is how hard they are. I mean, for them to have formed in the water and they're so hard is just unbelievable to me. Well, there's a little creatures that grow and live in them. Different ones have different creatures in them. And then when the creatures have outgrown them, it opens up and they live in the water or they actually will go into another size of one. But when they are, when they're opened up, they pop open, and then all you do is you find pieces in the water. So never do you find two alike because they're not together when you find them. The ones that I have the closest that are together are these, but they're not, they're not from the same grouping. They're just almost the same size. But when I looked at them, how close they were, that's how big it was. And there was a little creature living in there, and it popped open. So I just different things that we look at from day to day. Um, you know, just a couple weeks ago, the pastor talked about the snowflakes, how God created the snowflakes and how it's for us to enjoy. Just like walking on the beach and finding seashells. And I find when I go to the Pacific Ocean here, rocks. There's so many different kinds of rocks. And certain parts of the beaches have flat rocks that I really like to look at. In fact, I collected a couple of those and I have them by my house. So God has been so good to us when we stop and think about all the exciting things that he has made for us to enjoy. And it reminds me of, about creation. In Genesis chapter 1, it said, Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. And he certainly did with all of those shells. And let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So I always kind of remember what was created on the fifth day. Fish and fowl. And, you know, God made us special, too. He made this all them all unique, and he made us all unique, and we are special to him. 
So you can go back to your seats now. Good morning. Scripture today is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all, your, with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all the ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Now is a special time uh, of this service to join us communally and uh, to ask Lord to show him our praise and ask uh, so, uh, for supplications. If you can be so kind, if possible, join me in kneeling for a worship and prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come here today to ask to praise you for all that you have done for us throughout this week, that you brought us here alive, gave us another uh, time to be blessings for others and do your work here on this earth, that you provided us with uh, health and blessings and open our eyes uh, to see what you have done for us, that we might not be grateful at this moment, but we should be. Please be with us um, during this worship service. Uh, we all have our struggles um, that we asking you to help us with. Uh, our, each one of us has little health issues that we would like your blessing with. Uh, we especially currently ask for Dan Ely, um, who's having uh, his uh, problems with his heart. Uh, if you can provide your healing hand for him and, and bl bless him. Uh, we also pray for all the other people who are currently are not here, uh, your children, who's uh, having um, struggles, uh, health, or... Uh, Otherwise, uh, please provide your merciful blessing hands on them uh, and bring them to us so they can worship together for you. Uh, please be with the, our leaders of, this, of, of our great country um, so that we can still continue to enjoy the, bl the blessings and the freedoms that you graciously provided for us. Uh, we pr uh, please be with Pastor uh, when he brings us uh, the sermon today and let the words that he speaks to uh, speak to our hearts and bring us closer to you. We, we pray all these things in your precious holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Happy Sabbath to each one of you. This is the day the Lord has made. We'll be glad and rejoice in it. Amen. Amen. It's always a high Sabbath when you can have a baptism, isn't it? And just want to invite us as we seek the Lord before we open his word this morning that we would bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, this morning we want to thank you. Thank you for the great God that you are. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your loving kindness. Thank you, Lord, that we have opportunities to accept you. And this Sabbath is one of those demonstrations of one of those individuals who has done so. Lord, I want to pray for Richard and Luann and their continued life and ministry together as part of our family here. And dear God, I pray that the words of my mouth this morning and the meditation of our hearts truly would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, for it is in his name that we pray and all God's people said, amen and amen. People everywhere are asking for guidance these days. People look to various things to give them guidance in their lives. They're looking to things such as palm readers, palm readers who are actually diviners noted in scripture or sorcerers reading the lines on the hands to somehow look and determine what the future might be. Maybe you've seen them around the community. There are, if you look, those that would discern and seek to know the future. Then there are the astrologers, the astronomical, astro, astrological movements of the stars, differentiated from astronomy, but astrology, the positions of those stars, those heavenly bodies, believed to influence human affairs, those prognosticators, those people that would consult the zodiac, the 12 signs on the zodiac, the horoscope, knowing what your horoscope is, might determine somehow your future or something about you or what might take place in the future. There are the fortune tellers, the fortune tellers that are involved in seeking to know what will be in the future. Fortune tellers, seances, the Bible calls them soothsayers, those that would purport to have some magical powers. There are diviners, sorcerers, soothsayers, all astrologers. You see them in the Old Testament. You see them in the books of Daniel. You see them in the book of Deuteronomy, that the Bible is warning against those types of modalities that are really uh, seeking to lead people astray and have the forces of evil behind them rather than the power of good and of God. People everywhere seeking for guidance. Do we see them around us today? Wanting to know the purpose and meaning for their lives. Wanting to know what the future holds for them. And so they look to the astrology charts, the fortune tellers, the palm readers. They want to know what will happen next and how to prepare for it. For the Christian, however, one of the most asked questions is this, how to know God's will for my life? Do you wish you knew how to make the right choice in the decisions that you face in your life at times? I know I do. Do you believe that God has a plan for your life, a specific role for you, whatever age you are, whoever you are? Do you know how to discover that plan and how his plan includes you? At times we are frustrated by the apparent lack of guidance in our lives. On the one hand, some resort to the things that we just mentioned, astrologers, palm readers, fortune tellers. On the other hand, there are those who resort to such gimmicks as man-made maneuvers, such as flipping a coin. You might see that at some game or whatever, flipping a coin or drawing straws or setting up an elaborate routine for God to follow to make known his will. On the other hand, the intellectual 
concludes that God gave us all the guidance he intended to give when he created us with minds to think and to reason. But if logic and reason were the only approach on how God communicates his will, then the atheist and the infidel could also just as well make a, as good a choice as the Christian. And it would be a matter of IQ rather than spiritual insight. Morris Venden, in his book, How to Know God's Will in Your Life, refu refers to someone that we have mentioned before. He was a man, great man of prayer who is involved in the putting together of the great orphanages over in Europe. What was his name? George Mueller. George Mueller came up with the principles based on God's word for knowing God's will. And so Morris Venden, in his book, How to Make Know God's Will for Your Life, looks at those and adds a couple more perhaps to consider. And I would like to look at them briefly with you this morning as we begin our message. Point number one, points to consider. Number one, no will of your own on any given matter. No will of your own on any given matter. This does not mean you have no preference, but you are willing to go in whatever direction God directs. Can you say amen? No will of your own in any given matter. Number two, don't go simply by feeling. We should never make decisions simply by our feelings alone. Number three, study God's word to see what is revealed in his word that might give direction on your present current decision. Point number four, consider providential circumstances. Look at God's leading in the past and see how the current decision might fit into the pattern of life that God has already been developing. Good points, aren't they? Number five, consult with godly friends. This was not in George Mueller's list, but added to it. Godly friends, Psalm 1, verse 1. They consult those who are godly around you, not the ungodly friends, but the godly ones. Put their counsel into your portfolio to help you to come to that decision that hopefully is a godly related decision. Number six, ask God in prayer to reveal his will to you concerning the decision you are going to make. What is God's will? If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. James 1, 5, scriptures for each one of these. And then number seven, proceed with your decision, inviting God to open and close the doors as necessary. This morning, I'd like for us to consider Consider a story from the book of Judges that demonstrates in one way how one of God's friends looked for guidance and for direction. The story is found in Judges chapter 6 through 8. It'll be on the screen, and if you want to look at your Bible at that passage as well, that's uh, encouraged as well. The book of Judges. book of Judges records the period of history... When God raised up successive judges to deliver his oppressed people. You see, there was Moses in the Pentateuch. He's leading God's people toward the promised land. Doesn't quite get them there. There's another person who takes over. What his name? His name is Joshua. Leads them into the promised land. And then after Joshua, there is those individuals that God called to lead God's people to conquer those various peoples in that land because the cup of their iniquity as sin had reached to a certain level and God want, was now going to bring judgment upon them through his people. So they were successive judges, and actually 14 of them that are listed in that book. And they were to deliver God's oppressed people. It covers a period of some 350 years in the promised land, 350 years, time of struggle, time of disaster, time when the people faced in their successive stages, seven periods are described 
of their wandering away from God and then they're coming back to God. Isn't that how it is? We see through history, the wandering away and the coming back, the wandering away and the coming back. We can certainly learn from that, can't we? Are there moments and times in our lives and in uh, and others where we have times when we perhaps can wander away from God and then we realize and then we come back to God? Aren't you glad that God is a merciful and gracious God? will always be there to accept us back when we come to him in repentance and forgiveness and confession. God working through these judges. What was the problem? You see, the Israelites had intermarried with the surrounding idolatrous peoples and it had, as a result, begun to worship at their shrines and practice their values. And if you were to look at, uh, uh, for instance, I'll, I'll just mention here Deuteronomy chapter 18 as an example. It says, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. And then he mentions in verse 10, 11, and 12, witchcraft, soothsayers, sorcerers, mediums, spiritists, similar as what we just mentioned at the beginning of our, of our message this morning. So then when you come to the book of Judges and you see this is the context of what we're looking at today in this story of a particular judge that God used to bring his people back to the Lord. I'm glad for these stories. And so we have here in Judges chapter, in the beginning of Judges, Judges 6 says this, then the children of Israel did good. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for how long? Seven years delivered them into the hand of Midian. You see, the Bible has said, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, when you come into the land of Canaan, you are not to learn and to follow the abominations, the customs, the practices of the nations. You want to focus on me and on the true worship of the creator God, who I am to you, but they had lost sight of that. And as a result, they had done evil in the sight of the Lord and had gone away from him and began worshiping and following these other practices. It says, how long had they been delivered into their hand? For how many years? Seven years. The Bible records this, that whenever the children of Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up and destroy the produce of the earth and leave no sustenance for Israel. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel as a result, what are they doing? Crying out to the Lord. You ever been there before? Times of crying out to the Lord, times of going away from God and then realizing our situation, realizing perhaps how far we have gone away from him. And then as a result, crying out to the Lord, oh Lord. And it's happened so many times in the Bible, we see it and we've experienced it in our own lives. And so Israel, greatly impoverished, they are there being overrun by these Midianite people. And they cry out to the Lord. And God did hear their cry and called a man from a little place called Ophrah, O-P-H-R-A-H, Ophrah. And this man became one of the judges in Israel. And here on this hot summer afternoon was this young man. His name was none other than Gideon. Gideon was at a place perhaps like this pictured on the screen and when they were involved in threshing wheat, you see, and they do it in some nations yet today, threshing wheat. What do you do with the wheat? You throw it up into the air. And what does the wind do? The wind blows away all the chaff. And you then you have the leftover wheat. And so this was happening. Gideon was threshing wheat. But notice where he was threshing, threshing wheat. 
He was threshing wheat where? By the wine press to hide from the Midianites. Instead of being out in the open where they would usually thresh the wheat, they were there. He was in this case, he was in the place that was a hidden area. It was where the grapes would be trod, where there was a wine press, perhaps something like this, away from the open. Why was he doing that? Why was he there? Because he was hiding from the Midianites. Now notice what's going to happen next. Suddenly, Gideon, looking up from his work, he was startled to see someone nearby sitting near a tree. He saw this individual. He thought that he was alone, but he looks over and he sees that someone is there with him. And the Bible says that it was the angel of the Lord. And the stranger spoke to him. The stranger spoke to him. Now the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. The angel came to encourage him. At this time, Gideon doesn't recognize as an angel. He sees an individual there. But the Bible says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now, hold the pause button right there. What's the problem with this? Because we just saw that Gideon was there threshing wheat by the wine press. Why was he there? Hiding. It doesn't look so much there that he's the mighty man of valor. But we read here, the angel says to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And my friends, we can gain encouragement from this as Christians. Because even though we are weak, even though we may be fearful... God comes to us and says, I know you are, but I'm going to call you. I'm going to tell you that you can do it in my strength. You are a mighty man. You are a mighty woman of valor. Through what I'm going to do through you. The angel comes to encourage him. I'm glad for that, aren't you? Then Gideon says, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us. You ever heard that question before? If God is out there, then why are all these bad things happening? You ever heard that question before? If God is such a good God, why is he allowing this or that? Or you know what I'm saying? And the news comes on and they see these terrible things happening in the world and they call them acts of God. Oh my friends, how far from the truth that is. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the God that we serve. God is going to answer. God is going to help them to understand. It's because the people had gone away from God. It wasn't God's fault. Whose fault was it? They had gone away from Him. They had gone away from the principles that God set up. And my friends, so many times, that's what sin does. Sin is a result of what? That the fact that people have gone away from God. Right? That's what Isaiah says. Your sins have what? Separated you from God. Sin does that. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? The same question, by the way, that has always been asked by people from all ages, from all time, from then until today. If God is good, then why all the evil in the world? Where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? And now the Lord seems to have forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. The stranger looked right at him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? Go in this might of yours. Isn't, isn't that what God told Moses? I want you to go and I want you to tell a message to Pharaoh. And the message is going to be, let my people go. And here, in the same way, God tells this judge 
Gideon, go in this might of yours, and you are going to save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? My friends, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But how is that going to happen? God says, go. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. That's the kind of God that we serve. Have I not sent you? And then he says, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Isn't that what Moses said? God, how can I possibly do this? I am not eloquent of speech. And God said to Moses, who made your mouth anyway? I'm going to give you the words to speak. He says to Gideon, I will be with you, Gideon, and you shall defeat the Midianites. He goes on and says, surely I will be with you. You shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Wow. The church of God. Although many of us will be triumphant at last as one church, as one man, because many become one in Jesus Christ. Amen? And this is what happens, the power of the gospel. And God was going to use this man, Gideon, in a mighty way to defeat the Midianites as one man. Surely I will be with you. That's the message of scripture, isn't it? He said to Joshua, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you. Emmanuel, that's what Jesus, the name of Jesus means. God with you us. He will be with us. He's with us. He's with you. He's with me. We can be thankful for that today in the commission that God has given to each and every one of us. But Gideon says some of his human nature comes through and Gideon can hardly believe what he hears. He wonders if he's been dreaming, wonders if this is all really real, if this is all really true. I think there's a phone going off somewhere. And then he says, show me a sign. Show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Show me a sign. Isn't that what human nature is? But God, I, I know what you say in the Bible, but God, I know what you want me to do. But just would you give me one more, one more sign, one more sign. So he remembers that he should be hospitable to this stranger who is there by the tree next to him. And he goes and he brings some food and he cooks that food. He takes a goat and some unleavened bread. And to Gideon's surprise, to his surprise, as he was there told to lay the food on the rock, pour out the broth, this individual told him. And what did he do? He touched that meat and that bread with his staff and immediately fire consumed them both. Gideon was now sure that this visitor had indeed been someone, not just an ordinary person. This must be the angel of the Lord. And he said, now Gideon perceived now at this point in time, he perceived, he realized finally that this wasn't just an ordinary man that came to be with him that day by the tree, giving him this message but this was actually the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The angel of the Lord encamps around them, though fear him and what? Delivers them. Are, do you have angels? Do we? Guardian angels? Angels that excel in strength that are there, right, ready to give us the guidance, the strength, the help in time of trouble, right when we need it most. I'm glad for a God like that that sends his angels, aren't you? What happens that very night, Gideon was told what he was going to do. The first step that God had for him was to go out and do what? Just go and look at what they were doing and kind of play the political correctness game or what was he told to do? He was told to go out there and actually do damage to those things. Isn't that right? What was he going to do? Supposed to do with those Baal's altars? 
Tear them down. Tear them down. So the dead, in the dead of night, he takes 10 of his friends to help him. Gideon, can you imagine? He goes out in the middle of the night. Maybe this shows some of his fearfulness. I don't know. His fearfulness and yet boldness. He goes out in the middle of the night with his friends and he goes down to tear the altars of Baal that his, by the way, his father had built. So you see the cycle there. Up and down, up and down. Father may be evil, son may be good. Son may be good, father may be evil. But this is what happened. And so they were to take down the altars of Baal. And then he calls for the volunteers throughout the land to help him fight with the Midianites. And guess what? Thousands of people flock to this person, this man, Gideon. Had God spoken to him? Was God going to use him? Could he know for sure that this is what he was to do? He asked God to show him clearly that he was making no mistake at all. And so what does he do? He says, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is on dry ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. What was the sign he was going to ask? If there is dew on the fleece only and the ground around it is totally dry, then I'll know that you are with me. What happened? And it was so when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together. He wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Wow. Wow. God was showing him a sign, an undeniable sign that God was with him and that God would use him to save his people. But you know, Gideon, he still has some lingering doubt. He still wants to make sure because, you know, maybe, maybe just maybe something was, he, he had some lingering, lingering doubt. Maybe the fleece uh, could have become damp from the moisture in the air. And so to make sure, he asked God to give him one more sign. And what is that sign? Do not be angry with me, he says, for let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on the ground, let there be dew. Let there be dew. Wow, what a God. Even in his questioning, even in his times of doubting, God was proving himself faithful to this man, Gideon, and he will prove himself faithful to you and to me today. What do you say? So what happened here? And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on the ground. Just the reverse took place. Gideon now has a great army of 32,000 men who came to surround themselves around him to go toward the Midianites. And what happens? The Bible records this. The people, God says, the people who are with you are too, what? Are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. You know, friends, sometimes God has to show that it is not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's how it's going to happen. It's not by the force of mankind, but it's by the power of God. And so Gideon is there with his 32,000 men. And God says to him, Gideon, there's still too many people. I'm not, this is not the group I'm going to use. And so Gideon says to the crowd, Now therefore proclaim in the presence of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. If you're fearful, if you're afraid, now's the chance you can turn around and you can go home. And you know what, my friends? 
That's exactly what happened. There were those who went home that day, the Bible says, and 20, 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Two thirds left. Two thirds left. Only 10,000 people remain. The people are still too many. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. I will test them. And you know what the test was. Were they going to be ready to leave at an instant when they went down to the water? Were they going to go down and put their head down and drink as if they weren't worrying about anything, about any enemies? Or were they going to act differently? The Bible says, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart. See, those who are ready for the enemy were not going to get down on their hands and knees, unable to leave in an instant. The ones that were ready were the ones that would go and bring the water up with their hand and lap it up and be ready to go. Those were the ones that God would use. Well, when it was all over, Suppose how many were left? By 300 men, I will save you. 300. From 32,000 to 300. With all the burgeoning population of the earth in the billions and people being born every day, it seems as if the task is insurmountable. But my friends, the God, all things are possible. God will use you in mighty ways as God used Gideon for the honor and glory of his name. That's how the message will go around the world with the power of the three angels. How would it be possible? He would do the impossible. God told him to arise and to go down into the camp. He says, if you are afraid, Gideon, I want you to take a servant with you in advance and go down to the camp and I want you to listen to what they are saying there and this is what happened Gideon and his servant actually did go down there and they heard a man telling a dream telling a dream to his companion and the dream was this he said I had a dream and the dream that I dreamt was I saw a loaf of bread that was tumbling into the camp of Midian and it came to a tent and struck that tent so as to cause it to fall and to be overturned and collapsed. And so it happened that the Lord told Gideon to give every warrior three things. What were they? A torch, a trumpet, and an empty pitcher. The 300 were to divide into three camps. They were to go up to them, up to the around, surround the Midianites, and they were to come toward them. And as they came toward them in the darkness of night, they had their torches and they had their empty pitchers and before their torches. So it was this, as if they, they were coming up in the darkness. And then when they got close, they were to break those pitchers. And when they broke the pitchers, the light would shine forth from the 300 men and they would blow their trumpets. And when they did so, in the middle of the night, all the Midianites, the thousands of them, they became unnerved. They wondered what was happening to them. And they began running and they began fighting one another. And that's how that battle was won because God directed it. In the middle of the night, they all blew their trumpets, all shouted at the tops of their voices, the sword, our sword, what is the sword? There's the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The Midianites Presume, presuming that Israel was attacking them from all sides. And as a result, a great victory was won, as great as any in Israel's history. Why? Because someone took seriously and inquired about God's will 
for him and his people. Our text of scripture this morning. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. To conclude our message this morning, there is this quotation. I just have to share it with you. From the book, Patriarchs and Prophets which says this, he was distrustful of himself and willing to follow the guidance of the Lord. Distrustful of himself. Sometimes we trust ourselves way too much, don't we? We should be distrustful of ourselves and trustful in God. God does not always choose for his work, men or women of the greatest talents, but he selects those whom he can best use. The Lord can work most effectually through those who are most sensible of their own insufficiency. See, it's not our sufficiency. Our sufficiency is of God, mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, the Bible says. Sensible of their own insufficiency and who will rely upon him as their leader and source of strength. He will make them strong by uniting their weakness with his might and wise by connecting their ignorance with his wisdom. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Guide us, O thou great Jehovah. Lead on, O Lord, our King eternal. What an incredible message to think how God can use us in ways we have no clue. I would love to fight a war like that versus something else. Okay, we're going to close inviting God to lead us on. Hymn 619, Lead On, O King Eternal. I'll lose the mask. And if y'all would stand with us, that would be great. Lead on, O King Eternal, the day of march has come henceforth in fields of conquest thy tents shall be our home through days of preparation thy grace has made us strong and songs. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sins of march has copies, and holiness shall whisper thy sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring Deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. Lead on, 
We want to follow you, Jesus. We want to hear your voice in the decisions that we need to make on a day-to-day -day basis. We want you to guide us. We want you to lead us. We want to be doing what you want us to do, to say what you want us to say, to touch whoever you want us to touch at any given moment. And I pray, dear God, that your name would be honored and glorified as a result. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.